Cybersecurity is unfortunately much more complex than just adding a question mark at the end of your password, and I'm here to explain why that is. Luckily for us, everybody's favorite government agency, the CIA, has defined three very important principles when it comes to cybersecurity. The first of the CIA triad is confidentiality, and it's the most relevant to the concepts in this video. Confidentiality exists so that sensitive information is accessed only by the people it's supposed to be accessed by. This is usually done by using some form of access control. The most common form of access control is authentication factors, be it a PIN or a password that makes sure only someone that has that certain factor can access information. But like passwords, access control can also come through authentication factors that are physical, such as hardware security keys or one-time passwords that are sent to a physical device that only you would have, like a phone. Both of these have their own vulnerabilities, which is why we combine multiple of these factors in order to gain access to something. If your login details are exposed due to a data breach, a second factor of authentication, like a 2FA code, acts as a second reference point to maintain access control. Access control is important for ensuring security at the endpoints of a system. However, other protocols are important to secure data in other parts of a system. Encryption is one of the most important solutions to secure data in areas where it could be vulnerable. Encryption works by encoding plain text into ciphertext through the use of cryptographic mathematical models known as algorithms. To decode the data back to plain text, you would need a decryption key, a string of numbers, or a password also created by an algorithm. You and I could spend years learning this stuff and still be very far away from grasping the complex stuff behind cryptography and encryption keys, which is why I'm not going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about. So what we've learned so far is that basic access control can cover the endpoints of a system, and encryption is good for securing the data while it's in transit or just chilling. Encryption is standard practice in tech nowadays and is very important, but you wouldn't want anybody that works with your data to have the encryption key, for obvious reasons. So let's say I'm some low-level cybersecurity nerd at the Pentagon, and I have to verify the data integrity of some crazy top secret shit. But obviously, I'm a low-level bum, and the Pentagon wouldn't want my ass seeing that. That's where a hash comes in. A hash is basically a footprint that can be generated through an encryption algorithm that would be unique to whatever the input was. A hash only works one way, meaning that if the ops got access to the hash of something very important, they wouldn't be able to reverse engineer it and get my very important data. Going back to the Pentagon example, a hash would be used as a reference point for the integrity of data, meaning if the data was moving from point A to point B, I could compare a hash generated to point A to the hash from point B, and if the hashes were the same value, I would know that the data was the same without knowing what the data actually was. Speaking of data integrity, it's pretty important, so let Wikipedia tell you what that is real quick. Data integrity is the maintenance of, and the assurance of, data accuracy and consistency over its entire life cycle. It is a critical aspect to the design, implementation, and usage of any system that stores, processes, or retrieves data. Thank you, Wikipedia. Data integrity is a fundamental concept of cybersecurity and pretty much anything to do with tech. So remember that, I guess. Speaking of Wikipedia, it's a good example of an application of an open source model. Something would be considered open source if its code and operations behind it were visible and could be accessed and modified by the public. That's good for someone like you or me because you know what you're downloading, and it's less likely that you download something malicious. But the keyword here is less likely. I guess that's two words, though. You can be a bit less weary of something if its operations and functions are transparent. On the opposite end of that, if you want to go download the latest and greatest free Fortnite skin changer, but know nothing about the creators of it, what the program does, or really anything about it except the fact that you want Renegade Raider, you're probably downloading a Bitcoin miner, and that would be an example of closed source theory. Something behind closed source doesn't mean it's a virus, though. Some of the biggest resources in tech today, like ChatGPT or the very algorithm that recommended this YouTube video to you, are closed source, and it helps to keep their cool proprietary tech stuff secret. The operations of billion dollar tech companies don't really concern average people, so let's go over some things that do. If I brought up cybersecurity to the average Joe, they would probably think of a VPN, or a virtual private network. At the start, VPNs were used for office workers that wanted to access things on their office's local servers when they weren't at the office, by convincing the networks that they were. This could be accomplished through tunneling, which basically just routes traffic through an extra point to convince whoever is at the endpoint that it's coming from from somewhere else. If I have a point A and point B, and point A sends some data over to point B, bro over at point B can pretty obviously tell where the data came from. But now, if point A routes his data through an extra stop, point C, point B is none the wiser and thinks the traffic came from point C. A VPN combines this rerouting stuff with encryption to secure your data, and you would think that whatever you were doing on the internet would be safe now, right? 
wrong. The thing is, when you route your web traffic through a theoretical point C, point C is really just a server run by your VPN of choice, meaning they have access to your data, considering they're the ones encrypting it. And most of the time, the government or wherever the VPN server physically is can get access to all the traffic going through it if they wanted to. And the bad thing about that is the government can legally just tell the VPN to be quiet about their shenanigans, and then anyone doing sketchy stuff through that VPN server is cooked. So what can we learn from this? Well, don't be an internet gangster. And also that VPNs are pretty good for being slightly more private and watching a Netflix show that isn't available in your country. So the next time you're sitting in a cafe drinking a $6 coffee and turn on your VPN while connected to a public network, be wary because the network could be cooked. Or if the guy who set up the Wi-Fi wasn't very smart, other people connected to the Wi-Fi could use your connection to the same network as a figurative middleman and intercept your web traffic and do a whole lot of other things that I'm not able to explain. One of the things that a goober could try and intercept in your web traffic are your cookies. They're so innocently named and anytime you open a website for the first time, you probably just instinctively click the accept all button and go on with your day. However, the cookie is actually evil. HTTP is a web protocol that is pretty much the backbone of the internet. And in simple terms, it's a rule set for interactions between devices on the internet, be it a router, iPad, computer, or a smart fridge. The HTTP cookie was invented so that websites could remember things about the user, like a login session. And that's the reason why you opened up YouTube right now and didn't have to sign in again. But but the thing with cookies is that they're a bit too powerful and expose the user to two main problems. The first one is that big companies like Google can just harvest these cookies and the data that comes with them and sell them to whoever they want for advertising purposes or a million other things. But I guess there are bigger privacy concerns to worry about considering there are products like the Amazon Alexa that exist. The second malicious use of cookies mainly has to do with those login sessions I mentioned. If you get some malware on your computer or if your web traffic gets intercepted, the cornball behind the attack can use these cookies to sign into a platform mimicking an existing session. And that means they don't need a password or any 2FA. And considering that this can be for any website, like your bank, that's a problem. Some important platforms try and combat this by automatically signing you out in a shorter period of time than other websites. But this would still be a problem if little Jimmy had a virus on his computer that can just keep stealing cookies when he logs back in. This could be possible through a rat or a remote access Trojan. And a rat is probably the final boss of computer viruses. Before I explain how a rat would work, it's probably worth mentioning how computer viruses viruses come to infect a device. And that's through clicking on something dumb, downloading something dumb, or getting socially engineered into clicking, doing, or downloading something dumb. Let's say for example's sake that you want to start editing some videos, and all the YouTube videos say that Premiere Pro is the best for doing that. But then when you go onto the Adobe website and see those godforsaken prices, you decide you want to download a cracked version. This fake version of Premiere Pro that you downloaded from a YouTube tutorial with 20 views might work, but along with the software would be a rat. And as soon as you run your new fake Premiere Pro application and give it admin permissions, you would be cooked. Most malware is nested within something that seems legitimate so that you have an excuse to run it. And once it runs, it can modify system permissions and registries to do whatever it is that it wants to do. In this case, it would be establishing a connection with an external server so they can spy on you and steal everything you have. Some other forms of malware are ransomware, trojans, spyware, keyloggers, rootkits, bootkits, crypto miners, and more. And most malware will be a combination of some of the above. With the example of a remote access Trojan, they would gain system permission through what I said earlier, and then they could log your keystrokes to get passwords, spy on your webcam and microphone, and download all your cookies and data, just to make sure that the rat is always running. They would use the elevated system permissions to modify the boot register of your computer, so it always starts running as soon as your computer turns on. Another cybersecurity tool that people use to idiot-proof networks and devices is called a firewall. A firewall is just a fancy filter that allows or disallows things to run or be accessed, and they can work over networks or with applications on a computer. They can be helpful sometimes, but are mainly just responsible for kids not being able to watch YouTube in class. Think of a firewall as a big net. It would block most large obvious things that try and get through it, but with smaller specified things, it's pretty easy to sneak through, making them a lazy IT worker's best friend easy to set up and low maintenance. Something that can catch more specific and advanced threats is an antivirus, something I'm sure you've heard of. Antiviruses are similar to a firewall in the way that they continuously scan for things that trigger them. The problem with this is that a new piece of malware would have time to cause some crazy damage before people are able to patch whatever the malware exploited. But it's also the reason why you could run some crazy ransomware from 2016 and it probably wouldn't do anything. Probably though, like don't go doing that, please. I was just making a point. The good news is that the clever people behind 
antiviruses have a solution that only works sometimes when a piece of malware isn't already known to their database, and it's called heuristic analysis. It's a fancy term for antiviruses scanning around registries and system files, and basically just searching for any sketchy behavior from programs. And if they detect something, they try to shut them down. But that only works sometimes, because if it worked all the time, then I wouldn't be having to make this video on cybersecurity. It is helpful though that companies try to keep us safe online. And even though it doesn't work very well, it's the thought that counts. Apps like WhatsApp encrypt your messages in travel, and Microsoft makes sure that Windows Defender is included in every standard install of Windows. So you at least have some protection for day-to-day -day internet browsing activities. But they won't protect you from yourself if you decide to be stupid. My biggest piece of cybersecurity advice is to use your head and don't be stupid. Oh, and also subscribe.